It's kind of a hot topic at the moment, for want of a better phrase. We're having a heat wave. And if you are having or have had a heat pump put in, it's a perfect opportunity to be able to have cooling put in your property. And if you have PV, essentially have it cooling for free. There's options such as um, uh, portable sort of air conditioners, which you've seen the one in the office we have uh, upstairs expertly installed. The ones you'd more be used to though are air-to-air -air heat pumps with fan core units, such as we have in this room here. But if you've got a, an air-to-water or, or a, a ground source, um, there are other options, aren't there, Richard? Lots. So, um, I mean, I think I could probably just, I pulled back the string, I'll probably just let you go now. Uh, and do your usual bit. So what, what what sort of things are we looking for if we're looking at putting cooling into our uh, either existing or soon to be heat pump system? So it, it's exactly the same as you would design for heating, but the Delta T's are different, much, much lower, especially on radiators. Um, and the gains as opposed to the losses are calculated differently so instead of we're looking at the worst day of the year when we're designing for a heating system no sun it's minus three it bathroom extractors are on the whole house is filled that's what we're designing to worst case with cooling you're doing the reverse you're looking at what's the worst case in terms of heat so we've got sun blazing through the window maybe we've got 30 people in the uh, in the properties the oven's on the kettle's on and it's looking at the opposite so actually rather that it's it's the internal gains you're more calculating for and yeah. it's a very good point about uh, the solar gain when we do when we calculate heat loss we're just looking at how much heat can travel through mm. that kind of material and for a winter's day you're not really getting much gain to calculate back from that because it's normally overcast, obviously. Uh, we're not calculating how much heat necessarily moves through the fabric of the building. It's how much is streaming in through your window. Mm. Very good point I hadn't thought of. So um, the, the U values are still used, but there's um, extras on gain. So you're looking at solar gain, which you don't take into account when you do heating for obvious reasons, because you want it to heat in the evening. Um, and um you have not taking into account kettles and, and ovens and stuff like that which they all depends how deep you go but they all kind of look at so they're looking to cool in the worst case and we need the same thing we need an appliance a boiler but the reverse of and we need an emitter because the delta t's are smaller so we we're, we're working with temperatures with a heat pump typically at lowest around six or seven degrees and we're looking at air temperatures of 30 degrees when you just look at those two snapshots there we've got a 34 30 degree difference 25 degree difference when we're looking at heating we're looking at a boiler that's 80 degrees we're looking at minus three we've got a lot more power power range there so the the principles are identical we need the emitter Actually, it's a collector if you want to get technical because we're extracting heat uh, and we're looking at the overall power. Mm. When you're looking at using a heat pump, you've obviously quite rightly sized for the heating. So we've already got the power that's kind of fixed um, for when we do the heating under MCS and we can't really go uh, off there. So as a rule of thumb, the output of a cooling of an air source heat pump, they're all different. You need to look at the, the suppliers, um, uh, technical manuals. But typically, if you've got an output of 12 kilowatt, it'll have a cooling capacity of around the same, maybe 10, 10% less. So 12 kilowatt, you're going to get 11 kilowatts worth of cooling. It really does depend on the unit. So do go, you know, do check, it, check them out. It should show you. So there's our power. 12 kilowatts of cooling. Is that enough? And that is what we need to establish before we can design the heat emitters. So unlike with the heat loss, we are sizing each room to get the size of the heat pump. With cooling, that's a fixed point. We've done that. So now we want to see where we can best use that power around the house, preferably in the rooms that need it the most. I would suggest these are probably bedrooms, and your main living area. So we've got the power, we could distribute all, all of that to one room, but you need the heat emitters to be able to emit that uh, same amount of power 
uh, in order for that full 10 kilowatts, for example, to be effective in that room. The problem is that again, where we're designing for heating, we've already designed the heat emitters and the radiators. So again, we've got a fixed point and that fixed point to give you an understanding is typically 30 to 40% of the output of that radiator in heating mode. So if, for example, you've got uh, um, an air source heat pump with a radiator on it and that radiator is outputting a kilowatt at a delta T of 20, in cooling, you're probably going to get a delta T overall of about six or seven and you're actually that output is going to reduce further. So you actually could end up with a three kilowatt at delta T of 50, a three kilowatt rated radiator on cooling. Actually, that'll only give out 300 watts. So you are you are dictated a bit by the existing infrastructure. You can change it. So um, just to clarify kind of what Richard said there, when we do heating, we've got a flow temperature of, uh, let's just say our flow temperature is 50 degrees, um, uh, and the air temperature in the room is 20. That's a delta T of 30 between the emitter and the room. With cooling, we can't have quite as low a flow temperatures uh, as we need. So the delta T is more like... Um, as I say, if we want 20 in the room, it might be 14 degree yes. delta T. So, and the reason for that is, so what's, what's our limits for the, for the flow temperature on cooling? Um, well, the, typically air source heat pumps are limited down to about seven degrees. Why? Because water starts freezing. So, um, because the, the medium is, is um, water. And what, what about, do you know if that changes if we use glycol? I do know. I've never seen heat pumps typically go down to six or seven degrees that I've seen. You'd have to read the technical uh, uh, manual. I suppose with glycol that would improve, but you're kind of well. We don't like glycol obviously because no. it reduces the specific heat capacities of our heat geeks. No, uh, so yeah, um, and you'll uh, have the same issue with cooling. So yeah, the the it can all be covered by the heat emitter. Yes, yes. ideally you want that as low as possible. You've got to be aware of uh, the dew point, otherwise you'll create condensation. Yeah, this part's key, isn't it, to the whole thing? Really important, yeah. So if, if the dew point, it obviously changes depending on the temperature of the air and the temperature of the material, of the, and, of the water, and the, and the difference. Humidity in the building. And the humidity as well. So greater humidity, great temperature, you're going to have really low dew point, um, or sorry, really high dew point in terms of temperature. Um, if there's really low humidity, actually, you know, you can get that temperature a little bit lower. So today, having a check 27, 28 degrees outside, um, pretty low humidity, the dew point is about nine degrees mm. today. That could literally change in three hours, right? So you, you can't, to my knowledge, I I don't know anyone who does a dew point set yeah. controller. Yeah. Um, so you're 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 kind of better off, in my my view, is one to give the consumer let them adjust the temperature. Mm. It's not that difficult, right? It's the no, flow temperature. The flow temperature. Yeah. So they can measure it and ensuring mm. they're always getting low. That's a bit manual. If I was setting it, I would set it typically to around 14, 15 degrees. Just to be sure you're above Just to that. be sure. And I don't want, if I know if I get, hold on, there's a bit of water, my view would be, yeah, it's 36 degrees today. So, so. just to clarify this, <coughs> what, what he's talking about is the water droplets that form on cold surfaces. Like when you put a bottle of water in the fridge, you, you, you know, you get it out, it's got little water droplets on it. If you get those water droplets in your cold pipes running around your floor, you're going to get little leaks on the ceiling. Uh, if you're doing a retrofit, it's unlikely you pulled up all the floorboards and insulated all of those pipes and then put a, a water vapour barrier uh, or a vapour barrier around that, that insulation. So we need to make sure we don't get um, uh, condensation appearing on those pipes. And on the radiators, you're going to get end up with wet carpets underneath. I mean, the radiators will probably be a pretty good clue if you've got it on the uh, on the pipework. And if you only see it just appearing, it's unlikely to be dropping, uh, forming water droplets. But this is sort of key to understand and to inform consumers about, because otherwise you could end up in uh, hot water, as we say. But it's with underfloor, it's easy. You mm. are you're set by the, f the 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 floor anyway, which is typically eighteen to twenty degrees is the maximum. So the maximum flow really you're going to be putting around your underfloor is going to be above the dew point. So, uh, what, what, uh, what sets the maximum for underfloor? Well, sorry, the minimum flow temperature on the floor. Well, again, the dew, the dew point does, but you'll find that manufacturing floor coverings will have a minimum as well. Right. 
So typically, again, my experience says 18 to 20 degrees, you're okay. Floor temp, there's floor surface temperature. Correct, which means right. you're definitely going to be above the dew point. We're going to be all right. Yes. We're not going to have this uh, a, a pool appearing on the floor. But the issue is the bit between that and the pipe work, isn't it? Because as the heat geeks would be aware, but perhaps not customers, the finished floor temperature is going to be above uh, in the cooling scenario the flow temperature of the uh, water going around the underfloor heating pipes. With heating, it's the other way around. You'd have hotter here, say 30 degrees, and the surface temperature might be 24 or something like that. This is working the other way around. So the issue you have there is, which I'm sure Richard about to explain anyway, is you've got very cold water here, uh, and then a, a high enough temperature here, your dew point could be in the floor and creating mould, right? It could, it could, yeah, it could. So you, we want to keep that dew point Right. Normally, I would set for underfloor around fourteen degrees. You're, you, you know, you might get it on some day, but I mean, it's going to be a really yeah. bad day. Yeah. Um, you know, the floor temperature is going to hit about eighteen, twenty degrees, six, six degree difference, roughly speaking. Um, and you know, if the air temperatures like it is here, twenty six, mm. twenty seven degrees, you've got a delta T there of floor temperature. You know, it's okay. You're going to get about 40, 50 percent of the output. In heating, you're going to get it in cooling. So if it's a three kilowatt output on the floor, you're going to get one and a half kilowatts. There's a lot of variables there because you've got the thickness of the floor makeup, what's going on top and how it's constructed together and how humid it is that day and your flow temperature. So the only way to do that safely is to guess high, a higher flow temperature. Which I would always do, Which yeah. is why it's kind of, it's not target, as Richard will say, or is saying, it's not target temperaturing, it's just, it's not... Temperature targeting, yeah. it's uh, just lowering by as many degrees as you can, which in the summer, you just want it a few degrees. You don't need it exactly 21, do you? You kind no. of just want to shave off the, the sort of worst bit of it. The rule of thumb is with underfloor, you will strip heat out of the room, lowering the room temperature by two to three degrees. Mm -hmm. That's that's the rule of thumb. And if you're working on underfloor, you've got all that thermal mass. You've got more mass for when you do get the sun bleaching into the, to the room. Uh, you've got more mass to kind of absorb that that energy without resulting in a room spike and uncomfortability. I think what it also does, which so uh, a lot of um, new builds, especially with exterior insulation, mm. um, and as they all do with the, this large glazing over, overlooking the south, it's like the you know looks ideal. Have these massive windows overlooking the the fields at the south, and don't realise that in the summer you're get, you're going to roast. So. With that and you have external insulation, what happens is, is the sun is beating in all day and it will just raise that room temperature to, to 30 degrees plus. Then overnight, when you are opening things up, opening windows and trying to get that call, you've basically created a, a massive storage radiator in your floors and, and, and your um, uh, walls. And it is just emitting overnight. You wake up in the morning after it's been 18 degrees, 16, 18 degrees overnight. You wake up in the morning and it's 26 degrees in the house. Yeah. And the new day and the new day is dawned. And so it starts on, all over on again. On this exact point, there's actually some free things that most people could and should do before we even get to this point, which is how you use the system. In the winter, you don't open your windows because you want to keep the heat in. Likewise, your behaviour in the summer should be, if you've got a south-facing building uh, or, or east or west, uh, you close your curtains when you know the sun's going to be there and stop that heat coming in the first place, just as you keep the windows shut in the winter. So behavioural change is obviously your first port of call, uh, less carbon usage uh, and energy saved. I, I think, uh, yeah, although they're all sensible, th all sensible things, but, but the most sensible thing is if you've got concerns of overheating and I think this is a bit more for large renovations and it's for new builds where you've got the plan set out you haven't lived in the property uh, as it's going to be if you've got large windows facing south and high insulation there is a good chance that this is going to this is going to overheat on average no if you look at the SAT report it'll, I'm sure it looked fine but again that isn't looking at design that's looking at an average taking into yeah. account evening temperatures and you don't want nice thick curtains over your lovely big bifolds you've just installed no no but these are things they're doing so they're they're um, building um, blinds right and you, then you have the the pergola or the or, yeah. you know the, the shading I mean, over over the back which is just restricted the view you've just spent tens if not hundreds of thousands of pounds to create so it does seem counterintuitive 
So what I would recommend is if you're doing a new build or self-build and you've got a large property and do be concerned if there's large glazing in south facing. Um, my view would be to get an aircon specialist in to run the calcs as we would for heat loss, but in, in reverse. They don't go into the depths. They can, the, the, the design software is out there. They don't go into the depths we do actually for a SIPSI guide heat loss, but they're more aligned to kind of a gas boiler sizing put a bit bigger in, but they have got really good rules of thumbs, no different than we have. So once you've established, right, this room here needs eight kilowatts, you have know that you need a 12 kilowatt for your heating. So we've got the power there to do it. Actually, it's about the heat emitters in that room. You think, well, I've got underfloor, that will do a kilowatt and a half. Mm. Okay, but well, I still need six kilowatts. How can I do that? Well, the, the, the air source heat pump can do it. We've now just got to add emitters so really popular and a lot of air source heat pump uh, installers who, who know and there's only like five percent of them would say if we do cooling we do the fan coils because that's the only way you can guarantee in quite a small space to get the energy out you can insulate the pipes so you can get them down to sort of the six seven degree mark and one fan unit will do Two kilowatts worth. So of wall, wall mounted fan coils, are you talking about convector radiators Both. or either of those? They're basically the same thing, right? Anyway. Right. Yeah. But exactly. you, people are more used to seeing fan uh, convector radiators anyway. Correct. But what again, if you're doing a new build, mm. then you say, well, hold on, I'm putting radiators upstairs anyway in the bedrooms, typically. Yeah. So you say, well, rather than putting radiators up there, put the fan assisted radiator up there, then that will do your heating fine. Yeah. Actually, probably use half the space you would. Um, for a normal radiator, and that will do your cooling. And we've, it's already joined to the heat pump. Mm. The infrastructure is already there. So the cost, actually, for example, to bedrooms to add cooling, if you're putting in a heat pump, to add cooling to bedrooms, is actually the cost of a conventional radiator versus a fan assisted radiator. Mm. And actually, it's not, it's a few hundred pounds. I mean, well, it depends on the size. But. Just on the data, as devil's advocate, uh, fan assisted radiator. They're not noisy as per se, but they make noise. You know, in a, in a sleeping area, might become a bit nuisance. Uh, if you're going to do cooling with them, you have to be aware of uh, the condensate pipe, right? So it collects the condensate so you can run them at lower temperature. That has to get outside somehow. Um, and you have to put, you'd be putting in uh, additional power supplies at each point. So it's another thing to consider. But while you're doing a build, it's going to cost you like next to nothing. Uh, 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 more uh, all of an issue with a retrofit, right? R rather than a, oh, with much more. Yeah, with the retrofit, yeah, there is obviously there's that argument. Do, is, is, do you know if the fans modulate in the? Um, they uh, don't. Well, they generally have. It depends on the ones, but they generally have three settings: sort of soft, medium, and low. Right. But we would normally size if I was sizing for a fan radiator to do heating. I would size it at the medium fan speed and not the high. Right, uh, because here's where there might be some kind of uh, contention with what, how HeatGeek would design a system. We would design, so I, I guess it would modulate depending on whether it needs to achieve the room temperature or, or it's at room temperature. The way we would uh, set that temperature control would be a degree above the um, weather compensated temperature. So it's always going to be on high because we yep. want it full emitter the whole time, uh, full emitter output, so we can get the lowest flow temperatures and gain the, uh, the largest scot. Also worth bearing in mind, I mean, these fans are tiny, they're tiny draw, but if you've got 20 of them, it, it is going to use electricity. So, you know, uh, it is a tiny amount, but it's probably worth factoring into your, your scots. Or maybe not, I don't know. Oh, I think, yeah, we're talking probably a couple of dozen watts. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's about uh, two, two, two watts over, per fan. It's just oh, not- Oh, it's like two, 200 over a house but that, Yeah, it's, right, it's, right. It, it's, not, right. it's not a great deal. I think, you know, again, if you- if you if you're 200 combined, watts, 20, uh, six months of the year though, 24 seven, if you've got continuous weather compensation, that's a math sum for another time. Maybe I'll just post the little maths here. You, we, 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 you could, probably next but nothing. Yeah, exactly. You're still probably looking at yeah. £10 a year. And when it comes to right, cooling, right. Um, there is this You've very... got all those benefits. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very strange that heating, no one, no one wants to hear a thing, even though all windows yeah, close. Yeah. Also, when it comes to cooling, people are quite happily go to Spain and be quite happy with a rattly old air con yeah, yeah. sort of shoved half in and out of the window <laughs> on the sash yeah, window yeah. Right, and think it is bliss. It, 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 I don't understand okay, it, well, but... One, one more potential contention to get, and this is probably my conservatism, which is unlike me. Uh, what one sort of potential downside is uh, air quality 
if you've got a dusty room, it could be kicking they up They all come with air, filters, you know? Adam. I mean, they, oh, they, they all, come with filters. They come with filters. Oh, okay, right. So uh, arguably, one could argue right. It's that cleaner. It's cleaner. Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, yes. Good to know. Right. Um, uh, so there is uh, another option. Again, this is kind of um, more energy saving uh, and can work for the summer. So I've got uh, an electric awning at my house. This, this is passive design, basically. I have an electric awning at my house. I have um, a uh, home automation system uh, and I have yet to install, which is what I'm going to get uh, Harrison and Matt over to record, my outside temperature sensor uh, and wind sensor um, and my internal uh, room sensor. So I've got fa uh, south facing very, very big um, uh, bifold doors. If my room is uh, say below 20 degrees and I get sun coming in, I don't want my awning out. I want that free heating that can feed back into my uh, sensor for the... Uh, I've Sorry guys, the uh, one of the microphones or both of our microphones just cut out. So uh, we've now got this set up. So as I was saying, if the room temperature is uh, below say, uh, well, let's say my room temperature is set to 21. Yeah. If the room is below 23, I don't, I keep the awning in because I want to, uh, you know, draw in that, take the solar that energy, yeah. uh, take in the solar energy uh, and my, hopefully my, um, my hydrogen boiler will sort of uh, modulate back, run at a lower flow temperature, get a higher efficiency. If the room temperature goes to above 23, and I know that there's sun out because I've got a weather sensor outside, which also me measures wind speed, awning comes out, and my uh, Velux windows are also on the same I.O. system. The Velux windows open, allow cooling in and prevent the, the heat source from coming in. Oh, so I've got sort of automated cooling and no, no kind of um, uh, no energy really used there at all. Uh, so the weather sensor, um, the risk there is uh, we have this running whilst we're um, obviously out of work. The windows don't open up enough to let any sort of burglars or anything. Uh, if the wind picks up, the awning automatically retracts. Um, and the, the, the Villex windows can kind of shut down. So there are other things, that sort of passive house stuff, really. There are other things you can do outside using energy, because even if you are generating PV energy, you don't really want to use it all on cooling. You want to charge a car and charge a battery and, you know, run your oven or whatever else as well, right? Mm, so yeah, yeah. if we can conserve energy, it's always a good thing. Agreed. So that we kind of gave an overall of cooling. Yeah. I know that there's a difference between cooling from a, an air source and cooling from a ground source. Can yeah. you just... Give us a quick kind of overview of the differences, what's better, what's worse. Except. So so this is the difference between active and passive cooling. So active cooling in terms of when we're talking about a heat pump is whether we're engaging that compressor. If we're not engaging the compressor, then it's passive. We are just transferring via a pump uh, fundamentally. So passive cooling on an air source heat pump is you can't really do you, if you wanted to passive cool something with a heat pump, switch the heat pump off and open your window, right? That's passive cooling. Um, you can passive cool using a ground source heat pump. And the way we do this is the ground loop or the water loop, we, where is actually pretty much here stable all 10, 12 degrees all year round, we're going to pump the brine through your borehole, through your ground loop, through, 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 through your... Uh, um, lake mats or whatever you're using through the ground loop and we are then going to use that 12 degree water that 13 degree water to go through your underfloor as we've explained through through your emitters and that's going to be generally above the dew point as well you can put a si simple blending valve on if you so so choose so we're actually only activating the pump of the circuit which is i don't know a 80 watt pump or whatever yeah, we're only actually activating pushing water around and what we are in fundamentally doing is extracting the heat from the house, putting it into that circuit and dumping the heat into the ground. Great for ground source heat pumps because come winter time, we're not starting from a base of 12, 14 degrees. We're starting off a base of 18 degrees, which means over the season, we've increased in effect our amount of ground array no different than turning up a thermostat on a, on a cylinder we're increasing the storage capacity which means the scots will vastly improve on your ground source heat pump when you are using it for passive cooling any idea i uh, just i'm going to do a simplified version of that so for, for passive cooling you're um running the water that goes through your radiator 
essentially straight into the ground to cool off in the 12 degree ground. And then it comes back out ground temperature to give you a cool radiator, which absorbs the heat or the yeah. underfloor heating. Any idea how much, if you engage that um, uh, uh, cooling as much as possible, any idea percentage wise, what it might do to your scop roughly? Well, scops from manufacturers are generally worked out based on zero degrees. Mm. What we know from from real life open water is actually we're seeing scots of, of, of about half to one more. So I think if we went through, if you went through a borehole, you're going to get slightly better. I believe you're going to get slightly better through a borehole. Yeah. Um, and I would want to see a ten percent increase, fifteen percent increase yeah. in scops. I would closed imagine, loop yeah, yeah, closed loop boreholes. The of course water source great for heating because yeah. that is pretty much a standard 10 degrees not zero degrees all, all, all round but when you, you dump your heat in it it's off down the river or or, or wherever so, but so you kind of don't need that you get you give and take there because yeah yeah the exactly exactly there is an argument to say if you're looking at heating and passive cooling with a heat pump you're actually better to use the ground than you are a lake Mm. I'll, I'll yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know take computer report but um so that's the difference between passive we're not engaging a compressor so anything using an air source heat pump it is active because you're creating active cool you could argue that we're we're, we're, we're unlike aircon where you're kind of punching cold air in we're more stripping heat out but um the effects are the same so can we have active cooling with uh ground source you can have active cooling with ground source as well uh, it's quite cost heavy uh, on it because you you've got um, it goes to passive first. So you've got plate heat exchangers, then you've got this four port module that you've got you've got to uh, add on. Um, you can also overheat the ground as well because you're going to have high you know high, higher higher temperatures, um, and the scops aren't as good as the valence. So what mm. what are you doing all this for? Mm. To have ultimately higher running costs and three times higher capital costs. So uh, what Richard's talking about is that the new air sources that are coming out using the RT90 refrigerant, they're already getting ground source kind of scops anyway, so the cost doesn't really work out. Uh, so, but this does save, what we're talking about this cooling, does save, especially for new build or, you know, high full-on renos, renovations, it saves on them getting a cooling contractor in quite often. Yep. So it, it often it saves away more money than it, than it costs if they're going to get I've not, personally, I've not seen any... Aircon domestic unit that is above 10 kilowatt. Our average unit that we put on is a 10 kilowatt. Mm. So we've already got a bigger than average aircon that you'd find in the house already. You've already paid for it. It's already connected. It's just the emitters being the, the kind of limiter. It, it's the emitters that you're going to be limited on and you might need to add some only for the cooling aspect. Uh, but if the, if the customer's kind of um, privy and understands what we said today, they can kind of play around with the flow temperature and maybe, you know, squeeze some more capacity than 40%. No different than we've done here. So uh, just another little note on that uh, geeky kind of uh, note. So if you imagine a radiator, perhaps Harrison can put some graphics here. If we lose the, uh, the top sort of two inches of uh, water in the radiator, the output of that radiator actually dropped by 70%. And the reason for that is you can't get full circulation around the top. It just kind of travels along the bottom. You'll get heat em emitting up here, but because you haven't got flow, you've not got turbulent flow, which increases heat transfer. So uh, likewise with... Uh, cooling in a radiator when we're piping bottom to bottom the cool stays at the bottom it doesn't really go up and over so you've not that's part of the reason probably for the 40 percent i would say radiators are much less output than ground uh, than underfloor heating uh, but that's for this reason where you're kind of really just emitting from the bottom loop actually what would be better is top bottom opposite end piping arrangement as our heat geeks know but then it would have to reverse its flow when we did cooling to work the other way around, mm -hmm. which all gets a bit mental. So really, cooling is a bit of a fudge. Having said that, how many weeks are we cooling for a year? One, maybe two? Let's just do something to knock a couple of degrees off rather than saying, I need exactly this temperature throughout the year. Uh, um, uh, you know, just something to improve that bit of comfort. Don't think we really need more than I th that. I most think if, if you've got underfloor heating, if you're doing a big, big renovation or, or, or a custom build, you, you, you're doing underfloor heating of some description in the ground floor. You've got an air source heat pump. You've already got the infrastructure. Yeah. It's, it's there. The, the, the cost is, with Valent, it's a chip, a, a few hundred pounds. Um, with others, it does it anyway. Are they as efficient? No, but they do it anyway. My view would be, well, it's already there. Use it. Yeah, yeah. If you wanted more 
for one room, my view would be let get that room size by an aircon guy so you know the power. It's not going to exceed our 10 kilowatt we've got. So you know the power, and they go, right, well, we know we can do the calcs. We know the, the, the underfloor will emit, and that is good because we're stripping mm. heat from mm. the fabrics, which can mm. be a problem, especially with new builds. So keep the underfloor, that's two kilowatts. We've got eight kilowatts left. This room needs six kilowatts, so we know we've got plenty in the engine. Mm. Actually, I need six kilowatts or four kilowatts, because the underfloor is doing some, of cool. Well, that's two fan coal units. Mm. Mm. Okay, and, and they go, well, I don't like those. They say, well, you're not having aircon then, yeah. because that's what aircon use. Yeah. So I, I, the, the, it is a much cheaper option mm. than buying a heating system and an aircon system. Generally speaking, the, if you want to have the whole house guaranteed at 18 degrees, right, you'll be paying tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands I of I think pounds. the main difference between what you're talking about and kind of my experience and my background, and actually this is your experience, your yeah. background, you're talking about the the new builds that you're looking at plans and seeing all this glass and you know it's gonna be that room my experience is uh, you know working in victorian houses actually so i'm kind of thinking chuck in a ship you can save a couple of degrees when it's really hot and you've got kind of a more of an issue where you've got this big glass fronted uh, building uh, facing south that's absorbing heat that you've got to somehow get out i mean let's be honest if we're looking at your average you know 1940s 50s house three bed semi if you're really worried about it Go and get a three hundred pound fan radiator. Just put, put, yeah, thing. but it, put it on your wall and you're done. You'll if you already fine. got, if you already got a heat pump though, for the sake of a three hundred pound chip, might be worth a go. Uh, we're experimenting with the one here though, so we'll kind of, um, you know, keep you updated on that. This is a nineteen sixties building, uh, and we'll just let you know how we get on. So if we do cooling with the air source heat pump, can we claim bus? Yes. Right. Thank you. Now your turn. <laughs> right then. <laughs> um, so I think. If with all the um, MCS installers out there, they will come from a heating engineer in, in background, which is probably what mm. where I it's helped me not to actually because I've just come from an energy uh, background. Um, they not many people know how to do cooling. I would say um, with the heat geek assured and going through that process, we've got we're training our guys to do it we're experimenting here we're finding real life data but we're we're able to immediately help those customers who are looking for some cooling you can again you're it's no different from going from an air source heat pump the thing is well you need big radiators don't you truth no you don't actually it's not as bad as you you think with cooling yeah you do you do need big radiators or a fan coil unit that's the truth of it um even if you went for an aircon unit, you're going to end up with a fan unit on your wall. So there's kind of no getting away from it. If you want cooling, you're going to end up with a fan core unit. And if you've got an air source heat pump, it'll work lovely. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, just a quick clarification. When he says uh, fan core unit, it's the same as convector radiator. It's a radiator with a fan built in. Lots of information there. Um, any more information? Actually, any videos you want to uh, uh, suggest for us to record? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, let us know what you think about cooling. What have you got experience with it? Um, good or bad? Let us know below. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Uh, hit the bell notification icon, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>